uh, for your adjunct instructor in psychology. Today we're going to cover chapter one, the science of psychology. These are the uh, learning objectives. I'm not going to read them to you. Um, so basically, what is psychology? It's the scientific study of behavior and mental processes. Um, behavior is it can be an outward. Oops, I got the wrong book. It can be an outward or overt actions or reactions. Um, mental processes could be internal or covert activity of our minds. Um, if you look at the, there's the optional video you can take a look at. Um, if you look at the the PowerPoint version of this. So psychology is a science. In order to prevent possible biases from leading to faulty observations, we follow what's called the scientific method. Why scientific? It prevents possible biases from leading to faulty observations. Um, there's a possibility to see um, what one expects to see. So in other words, we use precise and careful measurement using the scientific method. Uh, psychology's four goals is to first observe behavior. What is happening? Um, for instance, uh, why are so many computer scientists male? Um, that would be a, a formulation of a question. The explanation is coming up with a hypothesis. Uh, why is this happening? Um, the theory is a general explanation or a set of observations or facts. So we try to come up with a tentative explanation to form a theory. Um, a theory might be women are exposed to stereotypical sets, um, images of what a computer scientist is. Um, so Sherian set up a room uh, with geeky props. Um, and in those rooms, uh, the women were less interested in computer science than the ones that were in another room. Um, without geeky props that's related to the stereotypical image of computer science. Men were not affected by the props. So the prediction is, will this happen again? Um, so if we want more women in computer science, we have to change the environment or perception. Um, so that would be the hypothesis. Change the uh, environment or perception and it'll improve their um, view of considering themselves as computer scientists. Um, and then you have to have a control group. Uh, how can you change the, the, or modify the behavior from undesirable to desirable um, to create more equality and career choices? Um, let's talk about structuralism. This was probably the, the first, um, is really, Actually, psychology is a relatively new field. It's only about 130 years old. Before that, many philosophers um, wrote about issues about the mind or body. Uh, medical doctors discussed the connection between the body and the mind. Um, it wasn't until um, Edward Titchener came up with this term called structuralism. Um, it focuses on the structure or basic elements of the mind. Um, that every experience can be broken down to individual emotions and sensations. Um, he was interested in um, memory and sensations, experience with physical sensation and thoughts. Now, William Wundt um, came up with a laboratory in Germany in 1879. He's considered the father of psychology. Um, he was a physiologist um, who developed a technique of objective introspection. In other words, he, he looked at the process of objectively examining and measuring one's thoughts and mental activities. Now, Edward Titchener was a student of Wundt, and he brought structuralism to America. Um, my notes here. Um, he noted not only uh, physical sensations, but also thoughts can be examined. Now, Margaret Washburn was a student of Titchener, um, was the first woman to earn a PhD in psychology, published a book on what's called The Animal Mind in 1908. Um, structuralism died out in the early 1900s. Functionalism um, focused on how the mind allows people to adapt, live, work, and play. How do people function in the real world? Uh, for instance, avoiding eye contact in the elevator might be related to 
the primitive need to avoid what might be seen as a challenge. Um, functionalism was proposed by William Jaynes. Um, was taught in the first school in America to offer psychology, which was Harvard University in the 1870s. This influenced modern fields of educational psychology, evolutionary psychology, and industrial psychology. He wrote the book uh, Principles of Psychology and introduced us to the concept of functionalism. Mary Witson Calkins, she was denied a PhD because she was a woman. Um, and she was someone who uh, was the first female president of the APA. Um, so although she completed um, every course needed to earn a PhD at Harvard, she was denied that PhD because she was female. Um, she was a student of James. She was also the first female president of the APA, American Psychological Association, taught at Wellesley College. Um, there were some African Americans who were involved in early psychology. In 1920, Francis Cecil Sumner um, was the first African American PhD psych psychologist at Clark University. He is also known as the father of African American psychology. He was eventually uh, chair of the Harvard Psych Development. Um, for more information, you want to look at Psychology's African American Roots on page nine of your textbook. Next is um, Gestalt. The word means organize whole. The focus is that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, started with uh, Wertheimer, who studied sensation and perception. Gestalt ideas are now part of the study of cognitive psychology. It's a field focusing not only on perception, but also on learning, memory, thought, processes, and problem solving. And it's an influential part in the psychological therapy called Gestalt therapy. If you take a look, this would be a Gestalt perception. Notice on both figures, the eye tends in to fill in the blank and you perceive a circle. Um, cycle analysis um, based on the work of Sigmund Freud. Now Freud was a noted physician in Austria. Um, his patients suffered from nervous disorders with no apparent physical cause and he proposed the existence of unconscious mind to which we push or repress our, our threatening urges and desires. He was not the first to deal with people suffering with mental illness, but he established a basis for psychotherapy with his ideas, um, especially with the ideas of early childhood experiences. Um, he also talked about the id, the superego, and, and the ego. Freud's patients suffered from nervous disorders. Um, and he believed that the, these repressed urges um, created nervous disorders. He stressed the importance of early childhood experiences. Behaviorism um, was a science of behavior that focused on observable behavior only. Um, it, it must be seen and in other words, they only take a look at what can be seen and measured. Um, you can't measure thoughts or unconscious or anything like that. So they just focus on what you can observe. Um, this was proposed by John Watson. This is based on the work of Ivan Pavlov, who de demonstrated that reflex could be conditioned or learned. Um, Pavlov is one who came up with what's called classical conditioning. He turned on a metronome every time before feeding um, dogs, and the sound of the metronome, which was a stimulus, it caused salivation, salivation in the dogs, which was a conditioned, basically uh, involuntary response. And um, he basically demonstrated that a reflex could be conditioned or learned. Watson believed that phobias were learned. And in this case of little Albert, he taught a baby to fear a white rat. Um, and he disputed structuralists and functionalist ideas and psychoanalysis, and he replaced it with behaviorism. He says, we can only focus on observable behavior. That's the only part that can be truly seen and measured. Um, so in his conditioning, he taught little Albert to fear rats. So in other words, he used behaviorism to teach a phobia. And he said, 
phobias can also be untaught. Mary Cover Jones, who was an early pioneer in behavior therapy. Um, she completed her master's degree under um, Dr. Watson. She had another a similar study called Little Peter, where she taught Little Peter to fear rabbits. And then she used what's called counter conditioning, taught him to no longer be afraid of rabbits. Um, she associated food he liked with rabbits, the rabbit's presence, and basically influenced what's called cognitive psychology today. The psychonet dynamic perspective is a modern version of psychoanalysis. Um, there's a lot of critique on Freud and um, his focus on sexual motivation and libido. The modern view is more focused than um, is psycho psychoanalysis on the development of self and the discovery of motivations behind a uh, person's behavior other than sexual motivation. The behavior perspective, <clears throat> um, Watson moved on to the field of advertising, but B.F. Skinner um, kind of took this further, studied what's called operant conditioning of voluntary behavior. Um, and behaviorism basically became a major force in 20th century psychology. He introduced the concept of reinforcement to behaviorism. Now, the humanistic perspective um, came out, uh, this was the third force in psychology. And it's a, basically a reaction to psychoanalysis and behaviorism. Um, it owes a great deal to early roots in the field of philosophy um, that people have free will and the freedom to choose their own destiny. The early founders are um, Abraham Maslow with his hierarchy of needs and Carl Rogers with basically his um, focus on self-actualization. The humanistic perspective emphasizes the human potential, the ability of each person to become the best person he or she can be. Um, so in other words, if we create the right um, caring environment, we can help people become self-actualized. Now, the cognitive perspective focuses more on memory, intelligence, perception, problem solving, and learning um, has become a major force in psychology, especially with the development of computers that try to replicate models of human thinking. Um, the social cultural perspective focuses on the relationship between social behavior and culture, uh, like social psychology, which is a study of groups, social roles, and rules of social actions and relationships or cultural psychology, which is a study of cultural norms, values, and expectations. In other words, we're looking at how our behavior is influenced by the group, culture, social norms of which we live. Um, social cultural research is a study performed in different cultures. Darley and Latane um, in 1968 um, studied the presence of other people that lessen the chance of a person in trouble receiving help. This is called the bystander effect. And the result is um, came up with what's called the, the diffusion of responsibility. Um, the social cultural perspective says, you know, people tend to diffuse responsibility to other people the more people are, that are around. The biopsychological perspective is a study of <coughs> biological basis of behavior and mental processes. Um, it attributes human and animal behavior to biological events occurring in the body, such as genetic influences, hormones, and activity of the nervous system. Um, also known as psychobiology, has become a larger part of neuroscience. It's the study of the physical structure, function, and development of the nervous system. It's important to consider the biological factors, which considers hormones, heredity, brain chemicals, tumors, and diseases as biological causes for behaviors and mental events. And we'll cover this a lot more in the next chapter. The evolutionary perspective focuses on the biological basis of universal mental characteristics that all humans shares. Um, it looks at the way the mind works and the reasons that it works as it does. Behavior is seen as an adaptive or survival value. And if you want, you can watch a video on evolutionary perspective. Now, a psychiatrist is a medical doctor who has a medical degree, 
who has specialized in diagnosis and treatment of psychological disorders. Where a psychiatric social worker, that is what's called a master's in social work, I have some training in therapy methods who focuses on environmental conditions that can have an impact on mental disorders, such as poverty, overcrowding, stress, and drug abuse. A psychologist, um, and there's a video that goes with this, what do psychologists do? Um, if you watch the PowerPoint, you can click that link or go to uh, my psych lab and, and see these videos. Um, if you're a psychologist, um, it's a professional with a doctoral degree um, and specialized training in one or more areas of psychology. They can do counseling, teaching, research, and specialize in any one of a large number of areas of psychology. Uh, specialization could be clinical, counseling, development, social, and personality. Um, types of psychological professionals. Um, if you're considering a career in psychology, uh, if you look at um, where psychologists work, most of them work for university and four-year colleges. Uh, after that, it's uh, self-employed and profit and nonprofit organizations. Uh, most of them work in a clinical field or in a counseling field or in a developmental or educational field. Next is scientific method. This is our method of gathering data so that bias and error in measurements are reduced. Um, in my psych lab, there's a video too about the scientific method. Um, but again, we want to accomplish the four goals, description, explanation, prediction, and control. The steps in the method is to perceive the question, form a hypothesis, test the hypothesis, um, to avoid confirmation bias by doing research over and over. Um, to draw conclusions, to it support the hypothesis. Um, and then report your results so others can replicate or repeat the experiment. Um, you'll find these results in what's called peer-reviewed academic journals. If you Google or go to Facebook, it's going to be a lot of times you see that was called fake news. Um, you want to go to peer-reviewed academic journals like the ACA, American um, uh, Counseling Association, or the APA, uh, American Psychological Association, to find accurate information. Peer-reviewed journals are where to go to get um, good scientific-based research information. Now, um, one way to collect data using the scientific method is using what's called naturalistic observation, where you're watching animals or humans in a normal environment. The advantage is you get a realistic picture of their behavior. Um, the disadvantage is what's called the observer effect. If people know they're being observed, um, they tend to change their behavior. Um, participant observation is naturalistic observation, where the observer becomes a participant basically tries to reduce the observer effect by acting like the rest of the people in the group. Uh, another way you can reduce this is by using uh, one-way mirrors or cam hidden cameras to observe the behavior. Disadvantage is observer bias um, of observers to see what they expect to see. Uh, blind observers are people who stand behind one-way glass or cameras. So, um, um, you could do what's called a, a, a blind test where um, the people who are observing don't know what the research question is. Um, but each naturalistic setting is unique and observation um, may not hold or be applied to all situations. Next is laboratory observation. Unlike naturalistic observation, the done the work is done in a laboratory setting. The advantage is you have a lot more control over your environment. You can use your special equipment, you know, one-way glass and stuff like that. Lab disadvantage is an artificial situation might result in artificial behavior. Um, descriptive methods may lead to formation of testable hypotheses. Uh, let's move on to the next page here. Next is um, case studies, and this is where you can study an individual in great detail. The advantage is you get a lot of detailed information. 
However, it may not apply to every situation or generalize to every person of the similar characteristic. Uh, a famous study is the study of Phineas Gage. Um, he survived a steel tamping rod through his head. He experienced major personality and behavior changes. This would be a chance where you could, you know, study somebody who had a brain injury without actually having to create that brain injury. No one would volunteer for that kind of research. Surveys are where researchers ask a series of questions about a topic under study. Um, and then you have what's called a representative sample. sample. Um, this is the population that you study. Um, it's an entire group of people or animals in which the researcher is interested. Um, advantages of surveys, you can draw data from large numbers of people. You can study covert behaviors. Uh, people are more likely to share in an anonymous um, survey. Disadvantages, researchers have to ensure they have a representative sample. Uh, or the results will not be meaningful. Uh, people are not always accurate, too. There's what's called courtesy bias. In other words, people try to share answers um, similar to what um, we expect them to answer. Um, sometimes the wording of a survey question could also sway the respondent, or even the order of the questions. If I've taken really long surveys before, and Towards the end of the survey, I really don't care about the answer as much or answering accurately. Correlation is the measure of relationship between two variables. Uh, variables, anything that can change or vary. <clears throat> um, the measure of two variables go into a mathematical formula and produce a correlation coefficient, which represents the direction of relationship and the strength of the relationship. Knowing the value of one variable allows researchers to predict the value of another. For instance, the correlation coefficient really ranges from negative one to plus one. The closer to one or negative one, the stronger the relationship. If relationship is zero, that means there's no relationship. A poor, perfect correlation is a one or a plus one. Um, for instance, uh, the more education you get, the more pay you get. Um, that, that shows a pretty strong correlation. Or a negative one correlation could be uh, the more education you have, the less likely you are to smoke. That would be a negative correlation. More education, less likely to smoke. Positive correlation are variables that are related in the same direction. As one increases, the other increases. As one decreases, the other decreases. A negative correlation are related in the opposite direction. Uh, for instance, uh, the more education you get, the less chance you smoke. That's a negative correlation. However, correlation does not always prove um, causation by itself. Um, sometimes there's spurious or other reasons that cause that may be causing it. Um, this shows scatter plots of a, a perfect positive correlation, a modest correlation. If you notice, it, the third one shows no correlation. With the scatter plots. Next is experiment. An experiment is a deliberate manipulation of variables to see whether corresponding changes in behavior results, allowing a determination of cause-effect relationships. Um, so what you first have to do is come up with an operational definition. Um, you want to define the terms in measurable ways. Um, there's also a video you can look at to see a sample experiment in my social lab. Now, the independent variable, or IV, um, is a variable in which an experiment is manipulated. It's independent of anything the respondents do. Um, for instance, uh, if, if a kid watches violent TV, does it cause aggressive play afterwards? Violent TV would be the independent variable. No matter what, um, the independent variable does not change. Okay, um, It's independent of anything the respondent does. Um, the dependent variable um, is an experiment, represents a measurable response or behavior of the subjects in experiment. So kids watch violent TV, uh, the result is they play aggressively. The dependent variable is dependent on, on the independent variable. So 
um, the independent variable causes the dependent variable. Dependent variable never causes the independent variable. So a lot of times we have what's called the experimental group. And they're the ones who are subjected to the independent variable, like watching the violent TV. There'd also be a control group who are not subjected to the independent variable, or they may receive a placebo treatment, which is a, a sugar pill, um, which controls for confounding variables. Um, in other words, let's see if this behavior is different for the kids who are not exposed to the independent variable. Now, a random assignment is a process of assigning subjects to the experimental or control groups randomly. So some kids will be put in the experimental group, some are put in the uh, control group. This controls for confounding or extraneous or interfering variables. These are variables that interfere with each other and their possible effects on some other variable of interest. Um, next is the random assignment. Um, participants are assigned to the experimental group or the control group. They're subject to one or more condition and they're tested for differences. Um, the placebo effect has to do with the phenomena in which expectations of the participant in the study can influence their behavior. For instance, if I'm in a study for depression and um, the placebo effect is they may give me a sugar pill, but just because I think this is a pill that's I expected to help me, it might influence my behavior. Um, a single blind study is where subjects don't know whether they're in the experimental group or the control group, which is receiving a placebo. Um, that way, they're less likely to expect certain behavior. The experimenter effect is a tendency of the experimenter's expectations for a study to unintentionally influence the results of the test. In other words, my behavior as experimenter might influence the behavior of the, the people I'm studying. So a double-blind study is neither the experimenter nor the subjects know which groups are the experimental or control group to reduce placebo effect and the experimenter effect. Lastly is ethics and psychological research. Um, there's what's called the institutional review boards. Um, every university, um, government, um, organizations have these. Um, wherever there's research being done, where groups of psychologists or other professionals um, look over each research study and judge it according to its safety and consideration for the participants. Um, there's also a video in my social lab or my psych lab for ethical guidelines for research. Common ethical guidelines are the rights and well-being of participants must be weighed against the study's value to science. Um, so above all, do no harm. Participants must be allowed to make informed decisions about participation. Informed consent includes includes benefits and drawbacks of participation, and the option to drop without consequence. Um, deception, which is sometimes done in an experiment, must be justified, and any deception should be clarified after the experiment is over. Uh, participants may withdraw from the study without consequence at any time. Uh, participants must be protected from risks or told explicitly of the risks involved. Uh, investigators must debrief participants after their participation ends, telling them the true nature of the study and their expectations regarding the results, and data must remain confidential. Some common guidelines ethical guidelines. If for any reason the study results in undesirable consequences for the participant, the researcher is responsible for detecting and removing or correcting these consequences. For instance, um, I remember a depression study, a respondent was taking a placebo in a control group, but was in need of more care because they were having thoughts of self-harm. And so they no longer can keep them in the control group they had an ethical responsibility to make sure they received um, proper health care um, for their depression. Um, so they actually got the, the counseling and the, um, and the real medicine instead of the placebo. Um, other ethics, animal research answers questions we could never investigate 
in human research. Um, we've had great gains in psychology and in the medical field due to animal research. The focus is on avoiding exposing animal subjects to unnecessary pain or suffering. So if they are doing surgery on the animal, they have to use proper anesthetic, proper nutrition um, to not cause undue pain or suffering on the animal. Um, they're used in approximately 7% of all psychological studies. Finally, critical thinking is making reasonable justice judgments about claims. Four basic criteria is the very few truths that do not need to be subject to testing. In other words, uh, in psychology, everything is subjected to testing. Uh, otherwise, it's not really carrying truth. All evidence is not equal in quality. And just because someone is considered to be an authority or to have a lot of expertise does not make everything that the person claims automatically true. And critical thinking requires an open mind. Um, to close, I want to uh, throw out a few things here. Um, you've heard of this probably brain related news. Older brains cannot make new cells. Listening to classical music makes you smarter. Autism is caused by children childhood vaccinations. People only use 10% of their brains. Well, all of those items have been found to be false or have not been supported by conclusive scientific evidence. It's very important to check your sources. Use peer-reviewed academic journals. Um, they're much more reliable than Google, Facebook, or some fake news source. Um, this concludes our um, chapter one. Have a great week.